um, and how generous you know you are in offering your time, especially considering you've just come from Bangkok and Thailand, where you've been teaching a retreat. So I'm sure everyone here is just as delighted as as I am to have Ajahn with us, and uh, I don't think you need much more introduction. <laughs> Other than you are, uh, what's that word? Infamous. Infamous. So good friends. We're really good yeah, friends. Like thank you. Teaching bikinis and teaching the Dhamma as close as we can possibly get it to the early Buddhist teachings. So Ajahn has obviously very deep meditation experience and knowledge of the suttas as well. So when that's combined, it's something very powerful. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to feel the metta even through your Zoom screen. So uh, all right, Sam. without further ado, we <laughs> You've been zapped already. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Again, thank you all for coming here. It's for me, this is uh, what I love doing. I get so much energy out of it and joy from it. And any tiredness soon disappears. And this is a strange phenomena which I've seen again and again and again. Honestly, I should be exhausted. <laughs> But I'm not. You don't sleep very much. But nevertheless, there's the joy, the happiness that creates the sense of uh, no weariness. This is what the Buddha taught Nalakapana Sutta in the Majjhima that if you have some nice meditations, the five hindrances tend to vanish. But not just the five hindrances. These are five hindrances which stop you seeing the Dharma, which stop you being able to get into deep meditation. And not only those vanish, but also uh, what they call arati and tandi, discontent and weariness. And I kind of like that idea that you know when you're practicing to see the Dharma, it's not just the uh, seeing the Dharma happens but also you get some energy coming up and a lack of weariness. I was just talking today uh, to people who came for our lunch and talked to them afterwards, which I shouldn't have done because I should have taken a rest, but that doesn't matter because I was just saying what happens when you know how to meditate and you get some nice reasonable meditations, what happens is that you tend to really get some inner energy coming up, a different type of energy. And I was talking to some people today, just how years ago, that's many years ago, I was a young monk, I was still really busy building this monastery, you know, with your own hands and organizing all the projects. And I had to teach a meditation retreat for the weekend. And when I got to that meditation retreat, didn't know what I was going to speak about. And also, uh, was tired. And one thing, I know that sometimes people say, oh, Ajahn Brahm, we've heard all your stories before. And it doesn't matter, there's so many of those stories and some of them are put in a different way. And when you hear them, it gives you another really powerful angle on Buddhism. And this particular angle was, I thought, well, let's do something different. Let's talk about loving kindness with the breath. So do the breathing meditation and meditation, trying to combine them as close as you possibly can. When I did that, that was amazing just how powerful that was. For the first time, you can join those two powerful meditation techniques together. And it really sort of worked for me and obviously for many others as well. Because you do find that what happens for you is usually joined in by everybody else, which is one of the reasons why you will notice and if one of you on this Zoom retreat gets a very, very nice meditation, a very deep meditation, many of you too will get a deeper meditation on that very session. It doesn't care if you're separated by many miles. The fact is you have started together, you're in it together, and there's something which happens which joins you all together. And I, and I'm saying that because I was a theoretical physicist before at Cambridge. So I don't believe in these things easily, but it happens again and again and again. So when we 
get one person gets a good meditation, we all tend to get a much, much better meditation. So on this time, when I started doing this meditation, loving kindness and the breath, it was amazing just how much energy that gave me. But I didn't really get the full benefit until at night time. And at night time, I uh, went to bed, and not for long, because that was the evening that I had this really weird dream. And my weird dream that evening, I don't remember dreams that easily, this particular dream, I was visiting, it was like a, a sort of graveyard of you know, all the, my favorite monks who had passed away in Thailand and other places. And as I was going past this gravestone, it's in a dream, and the monk doesn't have a gravestone. When I went past this gravestone, in my dream, I saw was, you know, Ajahn Tate, T-A-T-E-T-E, -T -E, I think you usually pronounce it in English. But he was one of my favorite monks. Hey. Yeah, okay. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I just got a little notice here saying it looks like you switched to a different language. Please confirm your language. Oh my goodness, that's for me. <laughs> so I'm speaking in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I better say to what am I speaking in? English, I suppose. Now I've got to find that. Here we go. Yes. Great. <laughs> so I am speaking in English. Maybe I should pronounce my words a little bit better. So I hope that's okay for the machines. But nevertheless, as I was dreaming and I saw this beautiful headstone of one of the inspiring monks which I had met, that it exploded into this beautiful nimitta, this amazing light. Now remember, I was supposed to be sleeping. And of course, as soon as something like that happens, there's no way you can sleep. So I just went vertical and uh, crossed my legs and carried on with this amazing meditation. You don't get much, get much sleep when you have very powerful meditations, but who cares? The experience was so beautiful. And because it was so beautiful, that became the theme for the whole weekend retreat, putting loving kindness and my, uh, breath meditation totally together. And when you do that, when you combine some of these amazing methods of meditation taught by the Buddha, it has huge power, so much power that the mind just energizes your brain and never feels sleepy. You never have discontent, you never have weariness, and you're just buzzing all day. And so that is the sort of thing which you can discover in this meditation. You're sitting in your rooms or in your bedrooms, or wherever, wherever it is in your house, and as you're sitting there meditating, sometimes you can feel some power and energy coming into your body and mind. And when that power and energy starts to come in, it becomes so beautiful. I mean, enjoyable, lovely, delightful. All these words which the Buddha summed up in Piti Sukha. It's a delight which you experience in the mind. And when we can start to develop those delightful meditations, wow, you're having that. I usually say the time of your life, but if you listen carefully, it's never your time of your life, the time of your lives. I mean, it's gorgeous mind. And it's not just for the sheer pleasure of it. The meditation empowers you. It makes it just the whole body just tingle with good energy which is one of the reasons why it gets really healthy. And one of the reasons you do have some energy, one of the reasons why it can do this incredible healing on you wherever you put that meditation. As usual, you know, why do we meditate? Sometimes people begin meditation because they have some of these diseases, and I'm talking especially about cancer, 
And so many people have these experiences with cancer. I don't even wish to call it a disease. That's what makes it negative. An opportunity for understanding your body and moving that body into this beautiful energy, which people have to have to do that when they're meditating, because otherwise, you know, they're going to get even more sick. It's a sort of thing that a lot of time when I do give a talk, some people listen, some people don't, because it's usually two talks going on, the one you're listening in your ears and the arguments which people have going on in their head. This can't be right, you shouldn't teach like this or whatever. But when you uh, have a disease which is going to kill you, so you think, then it's amazing just how that makes people really interested, listening and committed to doing a practice. It's life or death. And so because of that, they really get into it and they find this mind has amazing potential, which a lot of people don't use. A lot of times we use our mind for worrying, for being upset, for finding fault. That's one of the... Uh, the points which when I first read that in the Buddha Suttas, the fault finding mind. And that's a huge object. The fault finding mind is when we find fault with ourselves, fault with our body, fault with our meditation, fault with our teacher. Today that's me and my agenda. So easy to find fault. But instead of finding fault, we look at life in a much bigger way. When I was with Ajahn Chah, I found fault with him so many times. And I remember some of the teachings he gave. And I thought, these are crazy teachings. That's not how the Buddha taught. But nevertheless, they came from such a powerful source in Ajahn Chah's mind that I couldn't forget them. I don't mean I couldn't forget them on the intellectual level. They were seeds planted in my mind just like the seeds plant, which get planted in the, the desert regions of Australia. And when the rain eventually comes, then everything starts to blossom. And the desert changes from being a dry, unhospitable place into this gorgeous garden in the middle of Australia of beautiful, beautiful, beautiful flowers. And sometimes you wonder, where did those seeds come from? Millions of them, billions of them covering what was usually just a dead plain, but now the beautiful flowers. And that was like some of the teachings which I heard from Ajahn Chah. At the first time, they appeared to be just ridiculous. I couldn't understand them, Had couldn't really see any uh, source of these teachings in the suttas. But there's something about them which stayed with me and I couldn't really forget them. There were seeds planted in an arid desert of my mind. But when eventually the, the rain came, you started to get some deeper meditations, the effects of this path started to happen. It was fantastic to see all these things I thought were stupid and rejected them, had no basis in reason, no support from the suttas, and just obviously irrational for the mind, how they worked. And one of those, uh, in case you haven't um, heard it before, if you have heard it before, that if you have understood it, then you'll start crying because it's incredibly, uh, an incredible simile. And that I say incredible, really honestly, because I couldn't believe it. That's why it's incredible. And I just rejected it, I thought, but those were teachings were put right inside of me. And when you started to develop your meditation, how amazing those teachings were to describe what happens. And what happens was, it was explained by Ajahn Chah as when you, uh, that his monastery, he said, and this was a long time ago when it was still very, very uh, foresty, just like a jungle, he said his monastery was not a jungle, but a mango orchard. And the mango trees have been planted by the Buddha himself. And straight away, I thought, no way. No, you can't say that. 
that everybody likes to feel that the Buddha went to your uh, place. Even right now, there are some, um, even monks over in Sri Lanka, who claim that the Buddha was born in Sri Lanka. And uh, when last time I, I was in Sri Lanka, they asked me, and this was at the big convention center, BMICH, about three or 4,000 people were there. So they asked me the question, is it true, do you think, Ajahn Brahm, that the Buddha was born in Sri Lanka? And I answered without any hesitation, no, everybody knows that's untrue. The Buddha was born in Australia. <laughs> and then I explained it afterwards. A silly question deserves a silly answer. But so when Ajahn Chah said the Buddha had planted with his own hand these trees in northeast Thailand, I think, mean, come on, that's impossible. But then he went on with this simile. And those are mango trees, as you would expect, must have the most delicious, sweetest, juiciest mangoes in the whole world, ever. And uh, Ajahn Chah also said that those mangoes are delicious. There's uncountable numbers on this mango tree, mango trees planted by the Buddha. But he said the difficulty is no one knows how to get those mangoes. Many people, they see the beautiful mango, they throw a stick up at it and the mango won't fall. They get a long stick and try and reach the mango. They will never reach them. They can get a ladder, they can shake the tree, they can get a, what's it called, a cherry picker. They can get one of these huge ladders you know, from the firefighting units. They can get a drone. They can get a helicopter. They can get whatever machinery you like, but they will never be able to reach those beautiful mangoes. There's only one way, just one way to get the mangoes uh, from the trees planted by the Buddha. And that is, as you all should know by now, sit perfectly still under the mango tree and it's perfectly still and then hold out your hand and because of the great wisdom and compassion of the Buddha a mango will fall straight into your uh, hand. Uh, of course I hope that you are still keeping your rational faculties with you and just don't just accept these things. To me, that sounded stupid. I mean, how on earth will that ever happen? There are no mango trees planted by the Buddha in uh, Northeast Thailand. There aren't any uh, ripe mangoes on those trees. If they were, how long does a mango tree last? Not that long. They'd all be sort of dead by now, probably. Or if there were any mangoes, the birds will get them first. They can fly and, and reach them. And I said, it is ridiculous. And if you did see a mango tree and you sat underneath it really still, how many years would you have to stay, sit under that before a mango would fall? And if it did fall, if you hold up your hand, Will it fall into that hand? Of course not. You know, and I, I said, and I'm sure you think as well, if you sat under there long enough and the mango fell, it would fall on your head and give you a big bruise. It would never fall into your hand. This is rubbish. This can't be true. This is irrational. It was only later on you found, wow, side of side of, such a beautiful simile. That's how it works. If you want to get any of the deep meditations. If you want to get the great insights, if you want to be one of the enlightened ones, you sit in your room where you are now. The mango tree is this beautiful canopy of teachings which are going to be over your head, in your ears over the next few days. And you just sit there and 
don't do anything. No, no, you have to do something. All you do is open up your heart, open up your wisdom, open up your mind. You will never think that deep insight, the insight which does cut through some of the problems, is not an intellectual uh, insight. You can read those in books, you can listen to them by great professors. This is an insight which you see, you feel, you get from experience much more than reason. It is not anti-reason, but to actually get there, you need this deep sense of courage, being able to not allow, not allow all of your previous understandings your intellect to stand in the way of truth. So much times you see things, you say, ah, oh, that's what he meant. That's what she really thought. That's how it works. You need to be able to see that, to feel that. And it's not just thinking about it. And when you actually have those experiential insights in the meditation, they will only come when you have this open hand He's sitting down there perfectly still with an open hand so real wisdom can actually fall into it it's a kindness an openness a peace a trusting that if you sit still then you'll see and see the dhamma so on this retreat you know, my my notes are actually see all i've got over here this is a little piece of paper with some notes on it, what I'm supposed to do. And as Venerable <laughs> Chanda knows, I never actually keep to what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> neither did the Buddha, neither did Ajahn Chah. It's wonderful to see he was a rebel and sometimes did things in a totally different way. And I kind of like that. Yeah, even, I mean, many people say this, they weren't there at the time. They said Ajahn Chah always used to have morning meetings and afternoon meetings. No. All Ajahn Chah would do if he felt the monks needed to meet together, then we'd meet together. If they felt we didn't need to meet together, we wouldn't meet together. And so even the routine at the monasteries were always changing, just like life changes. And it was always depending upon who was there. And as Ayachanda mentioned, this retreat, the time I had at Wat Pa Pong was not to actually to force me into a particular way of um, meditating. It was to allow me to grow, to let the opportunities be supported by the lifestyle, which was if you needed to, uh, miss the meditation or miss the meeting because you were in your own hut, either sick or you were in your own hut really studying hard, or if you're in your own hut meditating deeply. If you missed the meeting because you were in deep meditation, fine. The, even that story of one of the monks when the Buddha announced he was about to pass away. And I often quote this simply because he showed what the Buddha thought about being a little bit different or rebellious uh, for a good reason. There was uh, one monk who lived close by when the Buddha was you know, about to pass away and he never went to see the Buddha. He never went to sort of uh, say, you know, pay respects or anything or to serve. He stayed in his hut all the time. And when some of the other monks complained, you know, you should go and teach this monk. He's so lazy. He's just in his hut all the time. He should be coming to look after you for the last few weeks of your life. So the Buddha summoned him. And when he was summoned, that uh, he came and the Buddha asked him, why haven't you come to see me when I was, you know, when I'm about to die? And this monk said, well, because I thought the greatest way of paying respect to a teacher is by practicing well and dedicating all my mer merits, even though I wasn't at the beginning sort of an Aryan, 
to dedicate that to my teacher. And that's actually what he did. And I always remember that story. The Buddha praised him, said, that's a real monastic. You actually get yourself into deep meditations, peaceful, see great insights. And after a while, if you let your teacher know that that's what you've been doing, they too will say, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That's the greatest gift you can give to Ayachanda, to me or to any other monk. Breaking through, seeing that Dhamma, becoming another Aryan in this world. And that's your gift. And I remember just practicing that when this was that story when Ajahn Shah was about to you know, get really sick. And when he came, and we decided we'd read some of the suttas and the Vinaya. And in that Vinaya, we had heard that in the time of the Buddha, they had built saunas for the Sangha. And by the way, that is a wonderful idea if we can get some funds to build a sauna in uh, that wonderful new monastery we have for bhikkhunis in Oxford. Apparently, Ayachanda went in there once in a sauna in somebody's place, and it actually worked for her. She got much more healthy, and it's traditional to have a sauna. So when I first read that so many years ago, when I was still in Thailand, now I voted to let's build a sauna for Ajahn Chah. And we did, the monks built it. And after we built it, Ajahn Chah would come every week for a sauna, but he would also give us an inspiring talk on Dhamma. And that's what I basically worked hard for. I must be honest with you, it wasn't so much to keep my teacher healthy. I've got to be honest, it's embarrassing to say this. But I put so much effort into building this sauna so I could listen to Ajahn Chah more often. <laughs> to, uh, so he would come over every week. And when he would come over, there were some times that he would give incredibly powerful talk. And it's not anything like you can read in a book. It was live. It didn't just have you know, his teachings there had him there as well. It was where it was coming from. And my goodness, sometimes you're there, you're listening, and it hits the spot again and again and again, and you get so inspired. I mean, really inspired. And uh, sometimes, I don't know if you know, are monks allowed to cry? Certainly, I've cried many times when Ajahn Chah was giving a talk, it was just so to the point, so inspiring. And you feel this great joy and power and energy coming up. It makes it look so easy. And when, at this particular time, when he came and gave a talk before going to the, into the sauna, it was powerful. It was inspiring. It's like you always hoped Buddhism would be. It wasn't just telling you what to do, it's inspiring you. So you basically had no choice. You had to let go, it didn't matter what else. So after that particular talk, which I will of course never forget, I went to the back of the hall. There were so many other monks there wanted to look after Ajahn Chah. I've done that so many times. I remembered this monk in the time of the Buddha who never looked after the Buddha at all. Well, he did afterwards, is the best way of looking after the Buddha, and just went uh, to um, uh, meditate himself. And I remember that. So instead of helping my teacher, I respected enormously, I just went to the back of the hall, sat on the concrete, there was no cushion there, and just sat still for a couple of hours. It was over two hours. I was surprised at myself, I was sitting so long. And then Again, delicious meditating, meditation. It's hard to find the words. I call it delicious. That's not how it tastes. It, no taste there at all. Beautiful. You're not seeing things. It's not like sonorous. It's just all those senses disappear and the mind lifts up and you have a beautiful, amazing time. 
it's more inspiring than even one of the talks. And so when you come out of that meditation, well, that's when I thought, what's, can I still manage to meet Ajahn Chah? So I went to try and see Ajahn Chah. Oh, I better click on target. Okay. Yeah, good. When I went to see Ajahn Chah, that he had already finished his sauna. Two hours is a long time in a sauna, but was getting undressed and getting dressed again afterwards and having a, a shower. Two hours he was there. And so when I went to walk towards him, he was finished. He was walking the opposite direction. And it wasn't that me serving him anymore. He still was serving me, even though I was so junior. As he was walking towards me, that is when he, that's when he looked at me. I've mentioned this many times. If you want to criticize me, please do. But it was one of those times that he stopped and he had a look. And when he looked at me, it was, he saw that my mind was pretty pure. He'd just come out of a great meditation. And I don't mind saying that, being honest. And the next thing which happened, which was weird, was you felt him inside your, your mind. There is a thing called reading minds. And he was doing it to me. And I, did, and I knew he was doing that to me. And I was perfectly happy he was reading my mind. So happy because my mind was ready to be read. Please, each one of you, don't be afraid, because if ever you do get that ability to read minds, you only do it a couple of times and then you feel that most people's minds are not ready to be read. It's like reading a pulp fiction book, not even well written, let alone well thought out. And so because of that, <laughs> you're surprised. Now, honestly, would you want your mind to be read right now? And most people say, no, thank you. It's not ready, it's not inspiring enough. But Ajahn Chor saw that my mind was pretty good, so that he read it and he came out afterwards. He felt it. I was just standing, just staring at him. I can't explain how that felt, but you could feel that he was. That's what he was doing, having a look. And I was, felt him having a look, and it was a beautiful experience. But then afterwards, he looked at me really seriously. It's very rarely that a teacher like an Ajahn Chah would do that, look seriously. And then he said to me, Ajahn Brahm, I need to call me Ajahn Brahm, sorry, Brahma Wangsa, that was the uh, official name. When I came over to the West, I shortened it to Brahm because Brahma Wangsa is just too hard for people to pronounce. Even just uh, last night on the aircraft, how should we call you? Brahma, 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 what should we call you? <laughs> I said, Brahm is good enough. And if they knew me, Ajahn Brahm. But, you know, the full name was Brahma Wangso. And Ajahn Chah was incredibly smart. And he said, Brahma Wangso, why? And it's a beautiful moment. And I don't mind repeating this because this was absolutely powerful he asked me the question why he was obviously you know he had a, a nice meditation he wanted to take that further and basically enlighten me i'll give you that last little piece of the puzzle why and then i was only about eight nine reigns as a monk you know what i answered I answered, I don't know. He asked me that question. I said, I don't know. I was being honest. I wasn't above myself. I was just pretty stupid as a monastic. And every time I did something stupid like that, Ajahn Chah would always laugh. I caused him so much laughter <laughs> being his student instead of shouting at me or criticized me, he thought it was so funny when somebody did something wrong. 
<laughs> Fair enough. He started laughing at me. Uh, but what he gave me next was actually even harder to bear. He said, Rama Wangso, I will tell you the answer. The answer to the question why. And <laughs> the answer he gave really shocked me because he said, this is the answer to the question why. If any other person or teacher asks you that question again, this is the answer. And he said, the answer is, there's nothing. There's nothing. And he looked at me with so much kindness, compassion. He was a teacher trying his very, very best, you know, to give the Dharma to his student. And I just said, do you understand? He said to me, he said, no, I don't know. Oh, actually, sorry, I made a mistake there. He said, asked me, Brahma Wang, so do you understand the answer? And I said, yes, nodding my head. And he looked at me for a minute and then he said, no, you don't. And he walked off. And I felt just so depressed afterwards. Not really depressed, depressed. But, you know, the uh, Ajahn Chah had seen you much better than you could see yourself. I didn't understand at that time, but it, that was an important. What was important, the teaching, what's the answer to the question, why? And the answer is, there's nothing, there's nothing. Do you understand that? Do you? No. <laughs> so that's what you remember. A seed pl planted in your mind. And later on, you have some beautiful, peaceful meditations, each one of you. Don't rush it. Whenever it happens, it happens. And you have this beautiful idea comes into your mind. Deep meditation. What is enlightenment? What is seeing through everything? And the answer is, there's nothing. There's nothing. Understand? One day. And when you understand something like that, you don't look at me or I attend a, you just may not even have uh, an idea what Ajahn Chah looked like. He was actually short and fat. I don't know why it is, but sometimes many great disciples are fat. So I Chanda, you need to put on some weight. <laughs> Sorry, but... Uh, it's nothing. And that kind of insight always comes from the deep meditations. And the deep meditations come from inspiration. And the inspiration is there for you to open up to things. And basically, you don't have to do very much. If you had to do a lot, then you think, oh, no, no, you're not capable of getting enlightened. But when you realize it's not what you do, but it is how what comes into you, what you're allowed to come into your mind and how you can become inspired and how once you become inspired, it's automatic. You can't not be enlightened. It just, the whole process starts to happen. And of course, that's you know one of the things I'd love for each one of you to be able to feel, just the automatic part of enlightenment. The courses are there. And when the courses are there, the results happen. And it's not what you do. It's more what you don't do. What you don't do, you don't interfere. You renounce, you let go. I don't know how many times I've taught this. Uh, I remember just teaching it a day or two ago uh, in uh, the, the hospital. Was the last time I gave a talk, it was just actually just about 36 hours ago, in this hospital over in Thailand, Samiti Wade Hospital, because I've known a few people there for years. And 
Of course, you know, they love to be able to meditate. It's too many of you say you can't meditate. You try, but you just don't get the the right balance of you know how meditation works. And so I did have a cup of tea at the hospital, and I did uh, get one of the people in the front to come and have a look at it. And I said, is the tea still? This is about stillness and solitude, this retreat. What is stillness and how do you experience stillness? And there was the old simile, and I haven't got a better simile, which is one of the reasons why I keep repeating it. And you can show people and they can see it. They can try it for themselves and understand how it works. Is the cup of tea still yet? Or is it moving? And of course, this was a person came and uh, did this, was my uh, assistant. And he was very honest. And he said, it's not still, it's moving when I'm holding it. And be mindful. So I was mindful of the tea. It was moving even then. Concentrate. It continues to move. And how does it get this to be perfectly still very easily, even if you haven't meditated before? And of course, the answer was, what did the Buddha say? Let go. Renounce. Put it down. Stop controlling. Put it down. And I love that simile because you can see it. You can do it at home. Can you really hold a glass of water or a cup of tea perfectly still by holding it? Never. Because you know, even just holding it, your muscles in your arms are always moving. So you put it down. When you put it down, it becomes still so easily. Mistake number one, which people make, they put it down and they move it. Is it still here? No, it's not still. Maybe I should put it over here. I'm not over here, over there. Maybe I should put it somewhere else. Maybe I, I'm using the wrong cup. Maybe I should get another teacher. Not this cup, but another cup. <laughs> Leave it alone. Stop trying to control and being a control freak. Leave it alone. And it becomes still all by itself. And those are the sorts of similes which are powerful. You don't have to do anything. And I know I don't need uh, to have powers to read uh, Ayur Chanda's mind. I know she's looking at me now and I'm going over time. <laughs> Am I right there? Yeah. <laughs> this is not a claiming a psychic power. I've known you for too long. And anyway, so what I'm supposed to do, that's just an introduction. An introduction to what's going to happen over the next few days. So what I am going to do now, I'm supposed to be uh, giving you some refuges and precepts. Is that correct? Correct, Ajahn. So how many refuges do you want? <laughs> <laughs> but you got the... <laughs> we have like three refuges. I, I have to really res I restrain myself sometimes not to tell too many jokes. <laughs> And funny stories, but that's my character. I just sometimes after meditation, you're bubbling with lots of nice energy. And anyway, there was a, I was giving this talk in a hospital, and the head doctor there was telling me that the talk is being streamed to any doctor uh, over the Wi Fi system. Even she said many doctors wanted to come to my talk but they had to do surgery that evening. And so she said that many doctors even doing surgery would be listening to your talk. And so I thought, uh-oh, if I tell a funny joke and they start laughing, I don't know what they might cut off by mistake. <laughs> It'll be my fault. <laughs> that's, that's true. One of the monks over here, when he was an Anagarika and my driver, and I told a few jokes sometimes to keep him awake, driving late at night and to the airport. And what he did, he lost control of the car. He was he couldn't steer properly because he was laughing so much. 
I didn't really mind that. It's okay if it was a, a driver of a car and I was in it. But imagine that was a doctor. I'd be in big trouble. So anyway, I'd better restrain myself and just uh, do what I'm supposed to do. The refuges and the precepts. So hopefully you all know what those refuges are. But you can chime along with me. I just I've been a monk for so long. I just love these precepts. They're beautiful. So I like chanting in Pali. I'm going to chant the three refuges. And if you uh, wish to join in with me, please do so. Udang Saranang Chami Dhammang Saranang Chami Sanghang Saranang Chami Dutiampi Udang Saranang Chami Duty ampi damang saranang chami. Duty ampi sankang saranang chami. Tati ampi budhang saranang chami. Tati ampi damang saranang chami. Tati ampi sankang saranang chami. Those are the three refuges for those keeping the two precepts for these three days. I will teach the two precepts first. Don't do anything which harms another being, human or otherwise. And don't do anything which harms oneself. The two precepts, the core reason for all the other precepts. And the five precepts is not deliberately taking the life away from another being. Second precept, not stealing, not taking what's not yours. Third precept, no sexual misconduct. I think you can understand what that is by yourself. You don't need to look at the laws. And don't do anything which like harms another human being in that area of their life. And the fourth precept, don't lie. And sometimes people you trust, you know, that when they lie to you, it breaks this beautiful sense of you can be at ease with them. And that also means don't break promises. That's kind of a lie too. You tell somebody you're coming at this particular time and sometimes you have no choice that you are a delayed or something goes wrong. But if you don't really care about keeping your promises, that becomes breaking a precept. That's how Ajahn Chah taught me. And number five is you don't sort of take the alcohol or non-medicinal drugs, you know, which are going to uh, basically take away your mindfulness. You don't really understand what you're doing. You're not in control of your senses in the sense of you, know, you can't let things be you know, out of, uh, in a very dusty, dubious world of doubt and not seeing things or doing things clearly. If it's the medicinal drugs, something prescribed by your doctor or something you know is not going to cause any problem to you, like I have drugs, two drugs every day, and that is vitamin T and vitamin C. <laughs> I think you all heard that story before, a good cup of tea or a cup of coffee or whatever you can get. and. They're drugs, but they're legal and you know how to work with them. You don't overdo them. And uh, those are the five precepts. And those of you who want to keep those eight precepts, just adding a little bit more is uh, instead of just uh, nothing which is going to be harmful sexuality in just the ordinary sense, 
and also nothing which is uh, any sexuality at all. So the eight precepts, uh, the, uh, was it, uh, our brahmacharya, where are many? That's, you know, not having anything to do with, you know, being an attractive partner for somebody. And, and it's, uh, no matter what uh, gender specification you are, just making sure that you put that world aside. When I was in Thailand, I remembered the first years there, and they would always say they had three genders in Thailand. It's not a joke, but many people laugh, but I found this really helpful. A male, female, a monastic. They actually put that in a totally different gender qualities. Pet ying, pet chai, and summon a pet. And I like the way they put it that way. So each one of you, if you're keeping eight precepts, you're like a salmon for the day, for the time. And when, you know, you haven't got robes on, you don't need to shave your hair, but you're doing the same sort of things which people do when they visit monasteries or temples or retreat centers. And that makes it so much easier. You can trust one another. Uh, I'm saying this, please excuse me, this is how I feel. But so often that people would come and ask me questions. And some of these people were, you know, regarded as really attractive women. I was heterosexual before. And I said, it's marvelous that you can ask those questions. And, you know, they don't feel that I'm a possible a romantic candidate for the future. So they can really relax. And they can treat you like a person, like a samana, a monk. The sensuality has got nothing to do with it. And that's an amazing thing which people can feel. And I asked them, is that true? They said, yeah. So you're another gender which can be apart from all that complicated areas of life and be talking Dhamma instead. And so that was that uh, addition to the third precept. And the other ones of the eight precepts is, Again, as you all know, not having any solid things to eat in the afternoon or evening. But don't take that as a path of uh, more of asceticism for yourself. If there's something you really need for the evening, fine, take it. There's nothing bad about that. The point is that you, know, you try and renounce as much as you can and still keep healthy. And that's the same for the... Uh, Ucha Sayana Maha Sayana and Anacha Gita Wadita Visuka Dasana Where am I? Those are not indulging in entertainments and like um, watching movies or uh, music so that it makes your mind more peaceful. So sometimes people would ask me, why can't you watch, you know, listen to some good music? And it's because it excites you. It takes your mind away from the most beautiful music of the world, which is silence. I've told many people before that when I was young, my favorite band was Jimi Hendrix. I know Venerable Chanda's favorite band was Led Zeppelin, and I think she's never forgiven me for telling her that I went to the first concert of Led Zeppelin in the Marquee Club in London as a young student. <laughs> but then afterwards, she moved from that to classical music, which was really peaceful, and then from the music of you know, going up into the hills or the mountains and just hearing these beautiful tones of of the, the streams after a heavy rainfall or just listening to the wind in the trees. That was what really uh, took me. And then after a while, there was a silence when nothing moved at all. And there's a few times in my life you actually heard, deliberately listened to almost absolute silence. I remember one time in the snow fields in Chithurst, of all places, it was, six, it was at 16 degrees below, and I went out walking uh, because I had no duties. And it was a magical time, freezing, 
but no sound at all. No cars on the roads, no birds in the air, no aircraft overhead. People, all same people, were indoors, huddled in front of a fire somewhere. Only crazy people like me would go out in the snowfields at that time, but that made it absolutely silent. And I, I, I never forget that, it's beautiful. And so silence is the best music in the whole world. Real silence. You can feel that. It's reassuring, it's peaceful, it's safe. And then uh, that's no entertainment. And then the last precept is uh, not uh, using higher luxurious furnishings. That doesn't mean not sleeping on top of a bed. You should make sure it's not luxurious beds, like water beds, or I don't know what luxury, luxury is these days. It is really a long time since I've lived out there in the world. But luxurious furnishings or seats or whatever, try and keep it simple. Let's become our eight precepts. The five precepts plus simplicity. And that makes going on a retreat so easy. But make use of it. Understand why it's there. And then it's easy to do. Okay. So now I'm actually going to keep to the schedule. So now I'm not going to give the five, the five or the eight precepts. I've explained it to you. You take them. They're there for you, however much you wish. And uh, good. okay, I can't resist these little stories. That's why I learned the five precepts just by uh, experience as a young Buddhist. And when I used to go to the Thai temple when it was in East Sheen, in just outside, well, not outside of Richmond, but between Richmond and Putney. Uh, when I used to go there, I used to go there often. And then one of the monks asked me, he said, you've been coming here a long time. I think you should receive the five precepts. And I asked him, what are the five precepts? And when they explained it to me, I told this monk, I was arrogant, I must admit that. And I said, I don't need to take the five precepts. I've been keeping them for the last couple of years. And that was more important, you're keeping the precepts rather than you are uh, keeping on receiving them. I received them already and I'm tired of keeping them. That's the most important. And you find they empower meditation. That's why you do it. And now I'm going to go back and keep to the schedule. Now it's supposed to be a toilet break. A letting go break. I know some of you have already taken that opportunity, but now keep quiet and do a little uh, comfort break. Okay, and please don't leave the Zoom room. Remember, you can turn off your video if you need to. So. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. <laughs> sorry for just getting into it, but. Oh, sorry. You get inspired. I do anyway. And that just gives you a big source of energy. Thank you. I hope it was okay. I think it was brilliant. I feel inspired. Excellent. Thank you. Do you feel inspired? Venom Rebecca's nodding. Nodding? She's sleeping. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. She's in agreement. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's amazing just as many people feel that monastic life is just really tough. You've got to be like a superwoman, you know, to endure the difficulties of monastic life. But I found it so much fun, <laughs> so much joy and so balanced. Mm -hmm. I love it. 
I think for me personally, because it's quite difficult to establish a monastery and it's uh, often, you know, you can lose a, sen a certain sense of humour, but I think, you know, when it's really difficult and when you're really tired, but what I always fall back on is just the deep meaning it brings, despite, you know, like, even though you're tired, there's something yeah. inside that's still quite joyful and, and satisfied with the way you're living. So even though it can be really difficult at times, which I think has to be acknowledged, you know, especially for the beginning. Yeah getting established still the sense of meaning and satisfaction that brings is something you can't get in the world absolutely so i think tiring yourself out for something good is actually well worth it and actually you get another source of energy mm. you get sort of this beautiful inner energy and you know if it wasn't for those bugs in your tummy <laughs> you know you'd be blissing out when you meditate you sit down please don't get upset because it's not, you know, you can't do much about it yet. But hopefully that when those bugs take a break <laughs> and then you sit down there, you just go whack right into the, the deep meditations. Yeah. As many people who know you would say you deserve it. Pleasure. I do and think even you working with sickness, you know, if you can't meditate as oh, much yeah. as you'd like to, what I notice is when I do get a chance, then I kind of don't waste the time, you know. I kind of leap towards the silence. And... Yeah, and that's a beautiful statement. That's uh, I know this word in Pali, pakandati. It means just you you do leap yeah. uh, towards it. It's like a deer, so it leaps through the forest, mm -hmm. and you don't do it. You can't stop it. You see something, and it just it's conditioned into you. Just go for the silence. Go for the the stillness, just that, or was it this uh, retreat is called stillness and silence. You can't ignore it. It just pulls you really strongly. And then you say afterwards that, you know, you go on a deep meditation. I didn't do anything. It just grabbed me and pulled me in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, Ajahn, when you tell the story about Ajahn Chah and putting one's hand yeah. out for the mangoes, and then you said, oh, you know, you didn't find that anywhere in the suttas, but actually, as you know, obviously, later on you find it, right? You find it in yeah. the volition where it says, you know, you don't need to make the volition. Oh, that one, yes. Because yeah. yeah. it's, it's natural yeah. that you're going for when you've got a mind of virtue, etc., etc. Yeah. So it actually is a natural process when we can just sit back, put the causes in place, then sit back. You know, and allow the person to do nothing. Mm. The lazy monk's path. <laughs> lazy monk. Yeah, you're the only lazy monk, Ajahn. Yeah, I am. Don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it happen. Yeah. That's great. Okay. I did say 10 minutes, so another couple of minutes to go. And then we yeah. do a guided meditation. It's okay. That's interesting about the monastics not being a gender. Yeah. Maybe. Because if that was true in reality, yeah. <laughs> there'd be a lot of bikini, yeah. and bikini monasteries and all gender yeah. monasteries, actually. And every gender. It'd be brilliant. Right? Yeah. And that's why not? Yeah. This is just kind of the start. And that's the other thing which is inspires me, should really inspire each one of you. You are supporting something which is historic. Yes, I mean, there's some resistance. As if it's something good, there always is resistance. Mm. <laughs> because you're actually moving things forward. Yeah. You're actually solving problems. And why were those problems there in the first place? Then somebody has some vested interest in keeping a domination uh, part of religion. And you're going past that and making great new grounds. Mm. And in Buddhism, this is absolutely much more powerful than each one of you know. So, you know to actually have a bhikkhuni monastery in UK. And it's a delightful monastery. If you haven't been there, my goodness, you should make the effort to go even just for a visit. Because it is an amazing place. Mm. And I just it's not just left. Yes. Yeah, and he wrote, he said, it's great. Oh, he wrote to you, did he? Yeah. Oh, super. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he really. Yeah, this is looks beautiful. It looks not just beautiful, you know, through the side. It's peaceful. It's quiet, and it's not that far from Oxford. So, but because of that, that's how the Buddha described you should place monasteries: not too far away, and not too close. So that people, you know, from uh, the town can easily get there with a bit of effort, mm -hmm. but not just so easy that you get swamped. Yes. It's not a tourist attraction. It's a attraction for Buddhists to be inspired. Mm -hmm. So when any of you go there, please keep the rules and be quiet in the monastery and, you know, you're there to serve and be served, not just one way. Mm. You don't just go there and say, what can I get out of this? So like, what can I give? I don't mean money. I just mean your help. And once you do that, you get so much joy. You are the community of a monastery. And people get... They've already started this and they'll only get worse or <laughs> more intense. They'll start thanking you, thanks for allowing us to come here. Thanks for allowing us to be a supporter. Mm -hmm. And too often people come and ask me, said, Ajahn Brown, what can we give you? What can we do for you? How can we help? So you know what I do. So personally, I've been a monk for such a long time, don't need anything. So I send it to some of these other great courses, like Anacumba. When you do that, right, and you just see the Manori, you know, is our treasurer, or and she has to count all these uh, donations and transactions, make sure they're legal, make sure that everything is done properly. That's really boring work, but when you know what it's for, you're actually helping build a bikuni monastery. Mm -hmm. That's immense. And everybody else on these committees, you know, I just see and Matthias and where's the other one's gone? Oh, Gunter, they're our volunteers. Yeah, Gunter. Is... Yeah, well, I don't care the volunteers. They yeah. give so much. So okay. basically, on the committee, or they're supporting the trust you know, with their great efforts and work. So it means that I agenda doesn't need to do all this by herself. She's getting more volunteers who really get in there and make it happen. And Paul, Paul's here. He's on Facebook. Oh, Paul, yeah. He's yeah. So he's been here from the very, very beginning. So, yeah, very good. Yeah. Stuff. And, and you've got Upeka there in the background, you'll yeah. hear from later on. Yeah, this is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you should no, never, not quite never. a full Sangha, but yes, it has a feeling of yeah. coming to visit the non Yeah, Yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah. great. And this is only where it starts. Yes. The Buddha only started with five disciples. Mm -hmm. Not where that went. <laughs> the millions, billions all over the world. Okay. So, are we all back now? I think so. Those who are back are back. Okay, excellent. Okay. So, now we do a, a guided meditation to 5 p.m. Oh, my goodness. Uh, 5 p.m. UK time, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Look. <laughs> Sounds good, though, Ajahn. It's now 9 yeah. three, so if we sit till 5 p.m., we'll be probably halfway wow. to Wow. Yeah. yeah, halfway to Nirvana. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is one of the things with guided meditation, you get to a certain point in your meditation, and you know you're talking about how to be silent, and I can't be a hypocrite. Sorry, but if I start talking about silence and encouraging you to be silent, basically I have to be silent myself. I can't resist it. So when I get to that point of silence, you find me just dropping out. So I do the initial guidance, but then afterwards you're on your own. 
I'm sorry about that, Venerable Chanda, but you've seen me do that before. I just can't resist it. When we start getting into it, you go for it. So here we go. So the first thing is close your eyes. I love it, closing my eyes. It's my first feeling of solitude. I'm cutting off, renouncing the world of sight. And I cut off the realm of taste and smell. I'm in my little office next to my cave. I'm so strict with my cave. I don't allow any electronic equipment in there. It's my refuge. It's an electronic computer which I can go on Zoom with is in my little office next door. My first job, if you ever read the Satipatthana Suttas, is to establish mindfulness as a priority. Parimukam Sati Upata Petawa. You may pronounce that wrong, but is to make mindfulness your priority to begin with. And I do that with the other requirement, which is uh, sitting in a comfortable position. I start with mindfulness of my own body. Just sitting here. Sitting on a chair rather than on the floor. And in order to start establishing that mindfulness as a priority, I just ask my body, how do you feel? It's what we do to our best friends, our children, our parents. We look at them and ask, how are you? We soon get a sensitivity to our body so we can know how our body feels. I can actually feel some of the tiredness in my body now. But other than that, it feels great. I like doing a sweeping of my body, starting with my feet. Ajahn Chah, you always used to say that Westerners have stupid feet. Because we were in our head, we knew more about dependent origination than we did on where we were stepping. So sometimes we would hit stumps in the jungle or step on ants. We always had bandages and bruises on our feet. That's why he said we've got stupid feet. I made a point after that comment of being more mindful of my feet. I can now feel my toes, each one of them. I can feel that my the balls of my feet, they're on a little small carpet. I can feel that. And it feels different to my heel, which is on the cold plastic tiles of the floor. I'm sensitive. It's fascinating. Those two feelings of the cold plastic of the floor makes it easy to clean or the, the carpet. What is the difference in those two feelings? I do this not to get information to write a PhD. I get this to actually get my mindfulness more clear. And 
They're both really amazing sensations. You see more of them. Sometimes you feel you could write a 10 page essay on the difference between a carpet and a plastic, just how it feels on the skin of your the soles of your feet. The longer you are mindful, the more you pick up information. I can also feel the sensations in the, the top of my feet. And to me it's fascinating how much sensations you have just in those two little appendages on the end of your leg, the feet. And how you soon you can be so aware of those feet that not only are they safe from injury, but also if they are sick, injured or bruised, you can focus on them as long as needed to give them some healing. Whatever you are aware of, it's not just the mind goes there, but the brain can be aware enough to send down healing energies, whatever is needed to keep your feet more healthy than they've ever been before. Then you move from your feet. Honestly, if you have this experience, I have it too. I don't want to move. Feeling so beautiful. So much delight, pleasure, if you like, in relaxing my feet. But I do this because I'm teaching you not just indulging. If I was indulging, I'd probably stay on my feet for the whole 45 minutes. I have to be honest, this, this is how I feel. <laughs> so I move up to my ankles. Ankles feel good. Sometimes you can twist an ankle. I was born in 1951, so my body has been well used, it's old. But many parts of my body feel great. My ankles, they kind of feel what I remember they felt like as a, as a baby or a young kid. Feel no pain or st stretching or squashing at all there. Instead I have the same sort of feeling as if I've been soaking my two feet, ankles included, in a basin of hot water. They relax so much. But I do that without the water, just by awareness and kindness. I go up past the ankles to the lower legs, two big muscles behind the bones of the lower legs, it's my calf muscles. I am careful not to get negative if there's any ache or pain there. I care for you, that's all. When I care to those muscles, I'm aware, I'm caring. And you find those muscles really do relax. Looking at the muscles at the top of the, of the calves, the back of each leg. 
to feel them tired. There's a lot of walking to do at both airports. I feel my muscles, they were a bit tired last night. I can feel the, the slightest of aches. I indulge them. Even giving loving kindness. You two muscles at the back of my calves. Thank you. May you both be at ease and happy and well. You did your job well last night. I can feel those muscles. I feel them start to ease off. Every time, and you confirm this, I smile at you, care for you, spend time asking any questions. That relaxes things and makes you more at ease, less tense. Because you're less tense, healing can happen in your body. And then you go from your calves to your knees. How do those knees feel? I can be aware of those knees. When I am, it's like you open up blocked channels. So energy and healing and health and comfort can be felt in the area of your own knees. My goodness, I open my eyes just to check the time. I have to go a bit faster, sorry. And with my knees, I go to my thighs. But before I leave my knees, I just check how they are. Are you more relaxed than when I started? And if the answer was no, I don't matter about how much time it takes, I'm going to stay there. Fortunately, those knees have relaxed. I go up to the thighs. Just feel if there's any aches or pains or tiredness there. And as I go past those two big thighs, I give them as much kindness, gratitude, and well wishing. Because sometimes somebody sends you a birthday card. You don't really know them that closely, but they send you one. It makes you feel happy. And that happiness which you feel creates health and relaxation. I inspire my own muscles. And then I am aware of the buttocks sitting on a chair. I have a heavy body and I can feel that weight transferred into the cushion of this office stool which I'm sitting on. My job is to make sure that feeling, those sensations are well uh, spread over my two buttocks, not concentrated in one spot. Because if there's mild spread, I know those feelings in my butt disappear after a couple of minutes. So then I go to my back. starting with my waist and making sure that nothing is held tightly there. 
Just looking for any muscle which is tightened up and stretched and loosening that pressure. Loosening all the time. Then I soon go above my waist and do like a body scan they can do just on these machines, these CT scanners. What I do it with my mind. And as I go up my body, if I notice anything which feels a bit different than usual. You do this often, you should know if there's something which is, they usually say not quite right, a difference there. And then if there is, you go back there or you linger there if you haven't left. You linger with your, your bowel or your intestines or kidney behind your back. You feel it. Once you feel it, it kind of relaxes anyway. And up from the bowels to the intestines. Sometimes I feel an organ round the back of my torso. I don't exactly know what organ it is. If I feel it's a bit aching or feels a bit tight, then I just stay there and imagine expanding it, soothing it, resting it, easing off any pressure on any of those organs. Then they stay healthy. Then I go up to my stomach. Above the stomach, the lungs. And I just let my lungs be. And I care for them with a lot of gratitude. Those lungs are just, I, I like to feel like my father does all this work to support the family. That's why like my lungs do that. Always supplying good air, taking out any bad byproducts. I see they too are caring for my own breathing. I'm going to do this a bit different this time. So I'm always already just getting so relaxed. My shoulders, I just relax them. The neck, relax it. The head, nicely balanced on the top of my neck. And then the front of my face. If I can see any muscles, which are being pulled tight or squashed. I'll find out why. Release that tension. So my whole face is at ease and relaxed. And lastly, I let go. Put down the cup. Just being, rather than having some sort of goal to achieve. My mind now is, is leaping towards that silence. I haven't done this the usual way but I can't stop it. So I will be quiet for 10 minutes.
getting close now to the end of this short meditation. How do you feel? How does your body feel? My body is so relaxed. How does your mind feel? When that gets still, you experience joy. What didn't work for you this time? So everything becomes an opportunity for insight. And now I invite you to open your eyes if you wish. If you want to keep going, fine by me. It is now at 10 a.m. or something in over in London. It is 10 a.m. Oh, what a wonderful day. It's a way to start the day. Thank you, everybody, for giving me the opportunity to serve. Well, now I'm going to mute myself and go to my next appointment. Is that okay? Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you so much for starting off this retreat beautifully and inspirationally.